artificial intelligence and machine learning systems have already been developed to the point where they can write music, generate automatic reports, create uh, visual art. They can even display human traits like curiosity and conduct experiments to self-learn and to further develop. We often talk about how humans excel in creativity, imagination, problem solving, collaboration and management, leadership, and we think of these as the skills that are never going to be replaced by a general AI. Um, and at least for now, AI is a long way off being able to replace these traits. But is it... Uh, that it's never going to happen. Will AI eventually outpace human capability and creativity? Of course, even if you don't think it's ever going to happen, um, and I must admit, I think it is quite likely that over the medium to longer term that um, automated machines will be able to at least emulate these capabilities. We still need to think about what the consequences will be if and when they do. Whatever the case, we're seeing more and more examples of original works being created by things that are not human, um, by autonomous AI. Businesses are increasingly investing in new artificial intelligence, in robotics technologies, in research and innovation, ultimately to enhance their competitiveness. And they're looking at ways that they can solve problems, create new content or new approaches to old problems using artificial intelligence. And this raises a whole lot of legal considerations in particular, and what I'm going to talk about in this second um, part of the week for lectures, it's not the second lecture, but it's the second part dealing with the consequences of autonomy. Um, so the kind of questions that we need to start thinking about is, well, who owns work that is generated by or supplemented by artificial intelligence? Who owns the intangible outputs, the, the intellectual property, if they're generated by a robot or an AI? Who owns the intellectual property rights? The manufacturer, the developer, the programmer, the person or the entity that owns the machine on which it was actually developed? Could ownership fall to the user who provided data for the robot to create the output in the first place? Or maybe the robot could create, oh sorry, it could own its own creations. What happens when inventions, source code, objects or other assets are created autonomously and then are directed by non-human entities? That's going to be increasingly the case over the coming years and decades. The distinction between human-generated works and AI-generated works is emerging as a controversial topic. Um, and so let's explore this a little bit further. In order to do that, we need to actually understand what an intellectual property right is. So in a nutshell, the common law developed over a long period of time um, essentially to codify um, some general values. And one of those values was that society is better off as a whole if people don't keep ideas to themselves. Um, and so intellectual property rights were developed as a way of ensuring that if somebody had an idea and they shared it, that the idea could be available for the general population on one hand, but there would be a limited right in the person who shared the idea uh, to exploit that idea over for a limited period of time. Uh, and so we have kind of two types of um, intellectual property rights, those that are registered and those that arise automatically just because they happened. So um, an intellectual property right effectively is, is in most cases a statutory right to have that limited right to exclusivity over the expression of an idea. Um, for a period of time. So the ones that need to be registered in order to exist are trademarks, patents, design rights, plant breeders rights. All of them are 
relevant to what we're talking about today, um, but we're going to kind of confine ourselves to thinking about patents. So worldwide, patents exist as a creature of registration. Uh, in every country, there will be a patents office or equivalent. In Australia, that's IP Australia. Um, and it registers uh, those inventions that qualify to be patentable. Now, they are effectively novel um, inventions uh, that further, that, that are not obvious to another person who is skilled in the relevant art. Um, the other type of uh, intellectual property right are those that come into being um, freely and automatically. And the key one here is copyright. Uh, so copyright doesn't protect the idea, it protects the expression of the idea. So if you have an idea for a story um, about a poor orphan who grows up in the um, uh, the slums of London and ends up joining a gang of um, uh, ragtag London street thieves um, and you decide that you want to call your story David Copperfield, um, then actually that's just an idea. But once you actually give expression to that idea, then you have a right for a period of time to exploit that idea. In other words, to sell it. Now, when I say it's limited, it's usually limited by time. So a number of years after the death of the creator. Already I can see all the little lights going on. Ping, ping, ping. Um, because how do we work out when an AI dies, if an AI creates a story and has an idea that is reduced to writing. Uh, now, after, and it's David Copperfield, the story written by Charles Dickens, it was in copyright for a period of time, but roughly 80 years after Dickens died, it became part of the general law. Now, a version of that story that then is illustrated by my own hand um, and written in a particular way, uh, I won't be breaching Dickens' original copyright by reproducing the content, but if I produce it in a particular way using um, my own artistry, my own invention, um, that particular expression of the idea will be protected. Now, we've spoken previously about copyright and how copyright covers literary works, including, and the definition of of literary works in uh, Section 10 of the Copyright Act in Australia includes computer programs. So essentially that whole regulatory framework and intellectual property rights are very much a creature of statute. They generally assume that intellectual property will be created by natural people. Um, in the UK, in the European um, patent offices and the US patent, patent offices all have rejected patent applications uh, in which AI machine Darbus was designated to be the inventor. Same thing happened in Australia and we're going to talk about that case uh, in a little while. Commentators have long distinguished between computer-assisted and computer-generated works. In many countries, including Australia, computer-assisted uh, work um, has created some copyright problems, but computer-generated work with little or no human involvement pose a significant challenge to this whole idea of copyright. Any works that are created by an autonomous AI or a robot will suffer serious hurdles in securing copyright protection. They might not have sufficient human uh, contribution for that copyright to even exist. Technological research and progress are often driven by the promise of financial rewards. So if there is uncertainty about whether or not uh, anyone not sure who that is, can exploit um, work that is generated by AI, there is a risk that there won't be investment in 
the creation of AI that is capable of generating that kind of content. Some jurisdictions have implemented specific provisions to protect literary, dramatic, musical or artistic works that are computer uh, generated. Uh, Section 178 of the UK Copyright Designs and Patent Acts includes a definition of computer generation computer generated work to mean work generated by a computer in circumstances such that there is no human author of the work and the author then will be the person who undertook the arrangements necessary for the work to be created. The World Intellectual Property Office's second, sorry, organisations, WIPO is the World Intellectual Property Organisation, um, has, has basically um, been focusing on this debate and talks about the attribution of copyright to AI generated works as going to the heart of the social purpose for which copyright systems exist, effectively the economic purpose that I mentioned earlier. So let's actually illustrate this with a case. Um, I refer to this as the monkey selfie case and that um, beautiful picture there on the screen is a crested mark monkey um, uh, with the name of uh, Naruto. Um, well, we don't really know what she called herself, but she was dubbed Naruto um, in a national park. Um, so the monkey, Naruto, um, was named in a plaint as a plaintiff in a case that was brought in the Northern District of California against a photographer, David Slater. Uh, David Slater had been in a national park uh, trying to take photographs when his camera was um, basically taken over by Naruto who uh, took a selfie. Um, beautiful picture there and it was published in a range of different places and then Peter, uh, the animal protection organisation, brought this action on Naruto's behalf, claiming that um, the benefit or the copyright in the photograph and therefore the benefit from the exploitation of that photograph, um, and here I don't mean exploitation in any kind of judgmental way, I just mean exploiting it for cash, um, the sale or the use of that image um, or the licensing of that image. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, effectively they argued that Naruta um, is the person who pushed the button or Naruta is the, uh, the being that pushed the button and as a consequence, um, the benefit or the copyright should have uh, been with it. The matter was actually uh, settled out of court um, and proceeds from the sale and the use of the image uh, are basically supporting um, the growth of national parks uh, where Naruto was. Um, but the US Court of Appeals did choose to rule on the matter and concluded that the relevant Copyright Act didn't make any provision for animals to sue. So poor old Naruta, her selfie rights claim, absolutely out. But it did leave open the possibility of animals asserting constitutional rights in other contexts, noting that animals still had constitutional standing to bring claims in a federal court following a precedent that had been set in another case in the US involving dolphins and whales. The case itself demonstrates the difficulties which arise when a creative act is carried out by a non-human entity. Now, I'm not suggesting that Naruto is an artificial intelligence, but I think you can see where the analogy comes from. The eventual conclusion of the courts was that with the, because the relevant statute didn't extend to protecting the intellectual property of animals or other entities that don't have legal personality, the wider question is, whether it should. And this is the question that the two readings you have ask in relation to intellectual property. So what happens when it's not an animal that is undertaking the creative work, 
butter machine. I mentioned the Darbus case earlier on, also referred to as Thala, and um, basically that is a case where patents were applied for in Australia, the UK, Europe, and the US um, on the basis that uh, one of the key inventors is a artificial intelligence. Now, ultimately, it was quite a pragmatic sort of text-based uh, approach that was taken to solving this problem, similarly to in the monkey selfie case. Uh, what the court did is it looked at the legislation, looked at the wording that was used, and then said, well, this legislation ultimately only provides for a natural person to be an inventor. So the key section was section 15.1, which is on the slide for those of you who want to have a look. Um, and it provides um, that a patent can for an invention can only be granted to one of four people. And when looking at those four people, um, they said on a natural interpretation, now this is the full court of the federal court, that each of section 15 1 b c and d describe circumstances where a person becomes entitled to the grant of a patent by receiving that entitlement from the inventor so it became incredibly important to this case to understand what an inventor is now ultimately they decided that in order to be an inventor under a combination of the regulations and the legislation as currently drafted, um, it was a question of it, it could only be a natural human person. Uh, and so as a consequence, even though there was no dispute about the novelty or the patentability of the subject matter, um, a patent couldn't be awarded to an inventor who was not a human being. Now, this raised a number of really important policy issues, and the federal court said these should be referred back to the um, to the government for the purpose of making or amending the legislation. If in fact the intention is that a AI should be capable of invention. Um, now, this is an appeal from an original decision, a decision of Justice Beach, single judge in the federal court, who initially um, found that the Patents Commissioner erred in denying the patent application um, because he found that it was possible for the inventor to be an AI. But that decision was overturned by the full federal court um, an appeal was lodged, but ultimately the High Court uh, dismissed the application. So effectively, there was no, it, it saw no substantial issue of law. Um, and so the application to appeal to the High Court was ultimately um, denied. Um, there are a couple of really important policy issues that come out of this. Um, the court openly raise a number of issues which he considered to be urgent given the facts in the case. So these are primarily focused on whether a person who is inventor should be refined or redefined uh, to include something that is not human by nature, an AI system. So this, the court said, really looks to requiring legislative change. Um, the two most important issues from my point of view here, sorry, the two, I don't know why I flipped the screen there, sorry about that, um, are firstly the patent grantees. If an amendment were to proceed, to whom should a patent be granted, granted in respect of an AI system's output? Can an AI also be the patent holder? not just the inventor. Um, the court considered a range of different grantees, which included the owner of the machine upon which the artificial intelligence software runs, the developer of the artificial intelligence software, the owner of the copyright in the source code, the person who puts the question to the artificial intelligence to develop its output, and no doubt there are others as well. 
For those of you interested in this analysis, take a look at the Thaler decision at paragraph 119. The other thing I think that was really important out of this discussion is the so-called inventive step. Currently, a key prerequisite for an invention um, that is patentable is that it must involve an inventive step, meaning that it's not an obvious thing to do for someone with knowledge, experience, etc. in the field of invention or in the field, the relevant field for invention. If an AI system were to be recognised as an inventor, then the standard of inventive step might need to be looked at as well, so that it's no longer judged by reference to knowledge and thought processes of the hypothetical, uninventive, skilled worker in the field. Um, so some really interesting things coming out of that. And that brings us to uh, the next uh, question that we'll be looking at in the next video, which is what does it mean for an AI to have capacity or legal status? Um, could it own property? Uh, could it enter into contracts? What's next? Um, but we'll discuss that in the next video. I'll see you there. You'll see me. Cheers.